Hey, everyone. Welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on keeping you informed on all of the latest financial news and ideas you need to know. I'm your host today, J.D. Durkin. Today, we are breaking down what is happening in the world of short selling, the short selling universe from company investigations to highlighting activist investors trades. As always, folks, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews to help keep your portfolio on track. With me here today is Edwin Dorsey. Edwin is the author of the Bear Cave newsletter. Very popular, and we're really excited for this conversation. Edwin, thanks, man. Absolutely, JD. I'm excited to be here. All right. So I live in New York City. If you live in New York, you certainly know Cava, Cava, C-A-V-A. These were these Mediterranean style, fast, casual restaurants are seemingly everywhere. Uh, they were and a big IPO name last year as well, but they are getting some negative call out. There is some concern. I know you wrote about uh, Lauren Bollock identifying risks to public health. Break down those risks, those concerns to Cava's business uh, that the report entails, Edwin. Absolutely. And this is a really fascinating kind of activist short report because it comes from an independent researcher who's posting these articles on Medium about Cava's health issues. The kind of like basic issue is that she thinks the food safety and preparation isn't up to par at long, at similar to larger chains. And the evidence she presents for that is that in New York City, the health and sanitation department needs to give letter grades to each um, restaurant in the city. And if you look at a Chipotle, all of Chipotle's dozens of locations are A-rated. McDonald's, all A-rated. Five Guys, all A-rated. Any major chain is all A-rated in terms of health and safety ratings from the New York, St- New York City Department of Sanitation, except for Kava. And what she points out is of Kava's like 12 or so restaurants um, in Manhattan, like three have, you know, B or C ratings, which usually highlight like severe deficiencies. And not only does Kava have a lot of restaurants that aren't getting the A rating and 90 percent of restaurants in New York City get the A rating from the sanitation department. Uh, These restaurants aren't properly um, putting up the signs to show they have uh, health and safety issues. And she specifically highlights that the Kava location closest to Wall Street, you know, in New York City, uh, doesn't show the C rating sign that they're supposed to be showing at all times. And then in terms of why they're getting low ratings, there's a number of reasons in terms of their food preparation. But the item she highlights most as not being cooked properly are these uh, meatballs, these lamb meatballs, um, where she says they aren't like, you know, because they they, they, they push it into like a meatball format before cooking it. It's tough to thoroughly cook all sides of the meatball and the internal side of the meatball. So a lot of people are getting E. coli or food poisoning from these undercooked meatballs from Kava. And then the second part of the issue in terms of problems at Kava is how do you detect um, these types of food poisoning incidents? And if you remember a few years back at Chipotle, where Chipotle had a big scandal around food poisoning that caused the stock to like get cut in half and really like hurt them for two years until they fixed their safety issues. Uh, they did a lot of catering. The, the first national incident for Chipotle was a basketball team ordered Chipotle and they all got food poisoning and they couldn't play because that's how you trace it to one location. And now that Cava is moving more into the catering business and opening up near college campuses. She believes that we're going to see a few national stories of food poisoning related to kava, and that could really cause the stock to dip because this seems to be a widespread problem at the chain. I mean, it's incredible. And to come from an independent researcher the way Lauren is, nonetheless, I admit, uh, not only do I know that Wall Street location, I have been to that Wall Street location. It is on Wall Street. It's not far from the New York Stock Exchange. I wonder, have there been any other investigations, Edwin, into kava after those original reports? And what more have we learned uh, since this all first came to light? I personally haven't seen anybody else publish on Kava, but she, she's published um, a follow on story. It just, you know, is a popular retail name where everybody's, you know, extrapolating growth forever. And she's saying, no, they're going to have a Chipotle like moment and the market is totally not pricing it. Um, so that's like a really exciting one to learn. She's highlighting a lot of like social media traffic on Reddit, on Twitter, where people mm-hmm. are sharing incidences of food poisoning. Um, I, I haven't seen anybody else really dig into this yet. And these concerns were only highlighted in the last few weeks. So it might take some time to get broader knowledge. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, again, we talked about the company in terms of being an IPO darling last year in terms of the overall IPO conversation, which is steadily having a bit of a revival. We're not quite back to where we were years ago, but we're getting there. Kava is one of the most frequently cited names. 
I wonder what could a potential public health crisis mean for a company like that, especially given the comparisons you've already made to Chipotle, challenges with uh, places like Taco Bell as well in the past. What, what could that mean to a business like this? So for Kava, you know, the, the, the simple analogy is like you mentioned Chipotle. And I think Chipotle, like 2014 to 2016, when they had their health scares, the stock fell roughly 50 percent. Same store sales got like whacked 10 percent over the, these two years. And they needed to replace their management to fix these issues. But then ultimately, Chipotle did solve their issues. They changed completely how they prepare food, how they clean the restaurant, how they sanitize everything. You know, I, I think they did like simple things like, you know, in terms of like cleaning the forks before they're displayed publicly. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, some of these issues stem from like forcing employees to work when they're sick and not giving them adequate like paid leave. So you might see that. Um, the simple thing is we might see one news story. And then if I see one news story on Kava, I'm really going to be curious to see if the media reports on more because her implication is these food poisonings are already happening. But if you go into a Kava on Wall Street and 50 other people go and you all get sick, you might not be able to trace it to the Kava. The big thing to be able to trace it to Kava and blame Kava for the food poisoning is like a catering type event or the media being more focused on these issues. Yeah, of course. I think that basketball team comparison you talked about a few moments ago, that really gives you that indication, right? If a whole group of players or a whole, whole one solid group is going to one location, easier to isolate. So I appreciate that part. Uh, let's talk now about uh, Soho House, members only club here in New York City. It's in many cities around the world. Uh, it's worth north of a billion dollars. It is said to have broken a uh, business model by Glasshouse Research. What are the concerns there? with regards to Soho House itself, Edwin. So Glasshouse Research early this month published on Soho House, roughly $1.1 billion market cap went public through a SPAC merger a few years ago. Um, the, the, the issues with Soho House is one, they've been consistently unprofitable. They have a 30 year, almost 30 year history of operations. They've never turned a profit. That's not a good sign. Um, and they're kind of trying to bucket into them into like a group of these SPAC mergers that have never been able to turn a profit and presumably will never turn a profit. And then, you know, another factor highlighted by Glasshouse Research in terms of problems with the future of Soho House is that the retention data is going down. So one thing they show in their report is Soho House previously disclosed retention figures for how many people stay a part of the club for at least a year. And then those figures started to inflect downwards. And now they've just stopped disclosing that completely. And that could be a leading indicator that people aren't going to be staying with the Soho House Club for a long time going forward. Um, Glasshouse Research also called the company, quote, a broken business model with terrible accounting, mounting debt, and poor internal controls, and uh, gave a price target of zero. Glasshouse, in terms of their past reports, tend to be very accounting focused. I can't speak to the specific allegations in this report, but I think they have a lot of accounting concerns at Soho House as well. Edwin, do you remember the show Inventing Anna? Do you remember yes, this, like, this do. whole side? So I'm, but even that to me, I mean, talk to me a bit about that because that was a, a, you know, I think in terms of like the cultural zeitgeist, this idea of someone trying to kind of like build her own competitor to it. But Soho House was the kind of the theme was featured pretty centrally in, in into parts of the show. And of course, it kind of gets to uh, the broader conversation of exclusivity and members clubs, to your point which as reflected in the show can have a bit of retention challenges for a model like this, right? Yeah. I you know, it's tough to say like exactly what's going to cause Soho House to decline in the future. But the biggest thing is retention, this feeling of exclusivity and wanting to belong as all humans do. You want to be in something that no one else can be in. You want to be part of a clique or club or, you know, seem cool. And then the problem for Soho House is that like they just aren't doing a good job retaining users. Specifically, if you go to like Q1 2022, Glass House research highlighted that 95.5% of people would renew their Soho House memberships. Then by Q4 of 2022, that figure dipped from 95.5% to 93.5%. So you started seeing this slippage where fewer and fewer people were willing to be part of the Soho House Club in New York City. And then the company just abruptly stopped disclosing that. So we don't know the figures for 2023 and onward. And, you know, um, I'm not sure exactly what to make of it, but it probably doesn't bode well for Soho House's future. 
And we have seen a lot of those reports indicating at least not accepting any new members at several key locations, including New York, L.A., and I believe London. But of course, I'm also reminded of what Groucho Marx once famously said. I refuse to join any club that would have me as a member for whatever that's worth. And that fits into the conversation there, too. Uh, let's talk about Hindenburg Research here. Edwin, while I still have you, it's a short seller known for call outs against companies like Block. Of course, that was formerly Square and has more recently released uh, an article pointing towards Renovaro Biosciences, market cap north of $300 million, calling it a worthless AI shell game. Give us those key points. What, what there is part of that call out and what should our viewers know? So Hindenburg has been in, on an absolute roll lately. They're definitely like the hot activist short seller in terms of the space. So Renovaro Biosciences is actually a renamed company called Enochain that they previously published on. And when they published on this company, Enochain, which, you know, does a lot on treating various cancers and has recently pivoted to AI, uh, they highlighted that the co-founder of the company um, was moonlighting as a musician and was, quote, charged by the Department of Justice over allegations that he conspired to hire a hitman to murder one of the victims of his many scams. So the co-founder and largest shareholder of this company is currently in jail for hiring a hitman to, like, kill somebody who's involved in these various scams. And basically, he said, uh, Hindenburg showed that the co-founder of this company is a George Santos-like figure who just has a history of scamming people, a history of fraud, got involved in this public company that was going to be treating cancers and then couldn't deliver anything and started killing whistleblowers once it started to emerge. That report was last year. Now the company has gone from miracle cancer treatments to being an AI play. And what Hindenburg showed in this report coming out last week is that the artificial intelligence capabilities of this company are de minimis. It's all spurious. It's all press releases without any substance. Um, and what they showed is that Renovaro Biosciences um, all their AI comes from this acquisition of a company called Jedi Cube. And Jedi Cube was actually, when they put out this press release of pivoting to AI and acquiring Jedi Cube, was just a two-month-old entity with virtually no operational history. Um, and Jedi didn't have any real assets other than Jedi, the company Renovaro was going to acquire for AI capabilities, said it was going to acquire a third company called Grace, but Grace is not an AI company either. It's just been this like 10 year money losing small startup that doesn't have AI capability. So this company said they're going to pivot to AI, is going to have some advanced AI capabilities, but it's actually they're going to acquire a shell that's trying to acquire another shell with no one with substantive assets, no one making real monies. And it, it's kind of just like, you know, highlights the absurdity of our market and companies that are really trying to get retail investor attention for AI capabilities when there's nothing there. And Hindenburg also ultimately said they see inevitable massive downside, um, which seems about right to me. You talked about what a, a, a prominent short seller Hindenburg Research has been. So let's stay with Hindenburg, but to a different company. Accusations of money laundering with Cash App specifically. NBC News recently reporting that federal regulators are looking into Cash App. Edwin, give us some insight into the Hindenburg research into Cash App and what the investigations could ultimately mean. So one of the, the biggest activists report last year, as you highlight, was Hindenburg Publishing on Block, which owns Cash App. And the, the kind of central theme of that report, which is really interesting and something I want to dig into, is that Cash App isn't, unlike Venmo, which is PayPal's like money transfer option, isn't accurately vetting its users. And in the U.S., any money transfer service, any bank, has huge laws around know your customer compliance. You need to make sure your customers are who they say they are. You can't you know, use payments to, you can't be sending payments to terrorists. You can't be using a fake name. You need to report certain transactions to the IRS. And at the center of this is knowing your customers and knowing they are who they say they are and that they're real people and they're U.S. citizens and the like. And what Hindenburg showed is, you know, Cash App isn't doing these basic checks. Hindenburg made a number of accounts under a fake name. They were order, able to order a debit card under the name of Donald Trump. The, the, this company is like not doing its basic know your customer checks. And when you have money flowing very easily and you have very poor like 
compliance controls, that means that terrorists and criminals could be drawn to your platform and want to use it as their kind of like de facto blank or way of transferring money. And that's what kind of Hindenburg hinted at. And then Gretchen Morganson, this amazing Pulitzer Prize winning reporter at NBC News, published another report saying whistleblowers have been raising concerns recently about that uh, Cash App is being used for criminal activities. Um, and what's particularly notable in the Cash App story is last week I highlighted in the Bear Cave that Larry Summers, a former secretary of the U.S. Treasury, former president of Harvard, generally like a really seen as a respectful, thoughtful guy with ties to the U.S. government, he resigned effective immediately last week from Square's board after about 10 years of service at the company. And at first, everybody said, well, that's an interesting resignation. We don't know what to make of it. But the fact Hindenburg published last year, Larry Summers resigns effective immediately last week. And now more recently, NBC News is publishing on money laundering concerns and whistleblowers at Cash App uh, that... The, the putting that mosaic together suggests there might be we might see more either from regulators or news organizations in the future about these types of issues. And then the other way this could have a spillover effect is, you know, Square doesn't exist in isolation. Some short sellers like Mark Pajotas have suggested that Square's issues could be could spill over to either partner banks that work with Square or companies that provide some of the payment rails infrastructure for these payments, with one example being Marketa. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, but uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot more in terms of government investigations or media reporting on like these money laundering issues at Square. That's an incredible story. So I appreciate the context. Now, in addition to keeping tabs on everything that's going on in the world of short sellers, your work at the Bear Cave also conducts its own company investigations. Edwin, what are some of the companies that you have found that really stand out to you as potentially having some pretty serious business flaws? So great question, JD. In terms of what I do at the Bear Cave, I like to say I generally focus on one to $10 billion publicly traded companies that I feel are misleading investors or harming customers. Uh, I like a lot of work on the harming customer front. So I like to look at companies that have deceptive auto renewal policies or deceptive cancellation policies. One prominent example that I've written about in the past and that's always in the forefront of my mind is Planet Fitness. We all know that gym subscriptions are tough to cancel, but Planet Fitness is a lot worse than your typical gym. You can sign up online, by phone, over the internet. It's very easy to sign up, but to cancel, you can't cancel it by phone or by email or online. You need to go physically to the gym you signed up to try to cancel. And a lot of times when people do that, they're told it's a payment processing day. Come back some other day. They're told to send letters and they send letters and it never cancels. And, you know, Typically, when businesses make it really tough to cancel subscription, you see a lot of credit card disputes. But Planet Fitness preempts that by generally only allowing people to sign up with debit cards or direct account ECHs. So you can't even have a dispute mechanism. So, you know, one thing I've written about Planet Fitness, is it really a gym company or is it an illegal billing operation with gyms on the side? And I think if you took out Planet Fitness, the millions of members who either believe they canceled or trying to cancel or being billed fraudulently, you'd have a lot less profitable of a business and the stock would fall considerably. And this will be a problem for them as the Biden administration really cracks down on junk fees, tough to cancel subscriptions and like kind of like the bad brand name associated with it gets out. So that's like one example of what I focus on. Um, more recently, I've written on problems at B. Riley, which is an investment bank that has ties to a Ponzi scheme co-conspirator and whose auditor might be in the early stages of about to resign. Uh, it's, it's just incredible context on all these names. Uh, where can viewers find your work and learn more and, and read the great work that you're doing in the Bear Cave, Edwin? Thank you, JD. The best thing to do is Google the Bear Cave newsletter and it'll come up. If you Google Edwin Dorsey X or Edwin Dorsey Twitter, my personal account will come up where I'm actively talking about stocks. There we go. The man himself. Thanks for taking the time. That's Edwin Dorsey, author of the Bear Cave newsletter. Awesome great. interview. Edwin, thanks, thanks a lot. Continue on, with the good work, really of course. It. Keep up the good work.